Chela Pandian, who is AVP and Global Head Talent, Culture, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and a LND at Biocon Biologics. Ms. Tina Vas, who is Senior Vice President, Global Human Resources at Sagility India Private Limited. Shalma Linath, who is Head of APAC Climate School at Exa Climate. Ms. Bardaraju Janardhan, who is VP HR at Flipkart. Padmaja Srinivas, who is Head of LND, Domain and Consulting at Wipro Technologies. And this light panel would be moderated by Shagufta Inamdar, who is Vice President, Learning and Development at DRGO. Please welcome all our panel speakers with a huge round of applause. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on the future of LND, what the next decade holds for LND department. I know the whole day has been about future of LND, and I'm sure with the sessions overflowing, you're also wondering what new are we going to talk about. So, guys, just let's look at this as a quick way to summarize a lot of things that we have learned uh, and heard about since today morning, right? Um, so conscious, uh, we are in the graveyard slot, but the panelists here are all charged up to make this the most interesting session of the day. And I say it interesting because here you'll see a lot of summarizing of, uh, of what we've heard today and you probably can take down your last points. Uh, so we have divided this session into two parts just to make it easy. One is we look at what is the impact of technology on the future of learning. And then we will move on to some softer aspects of culture and sustainability. Right? So going back 20 years, uh, 25 years, I should say, when I started my career as an L&D professional, I still recollect that the only motivation to come into the training room was a free lunch coupon. And I'm sure some of you who've experienced or seen that era can relate to this. Now, from the classrooms, training moved into the employee workstations in the form of e-learning. And from employee workstation, now learning has penetrated into employee workspaces in the form of in the flow of work. Now, what is the next level of transformation that l and is going to see? And that's really all about the future of learning. So let us start with understanding the impact of technology and how that's going to drive the next level of transformation for L&D. So we have an eminent panelist, uh, an eminent set of panelists here, and they have spent decades in the training and HR business. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of value from the things that we are listening today. And some of them have already had sessions in the morning on separate topics. That's why I'm saying that they'll be, in, they'll be summarizing some of those topics as well, okay? So my first question, Chela, is uh, to you, and you've delivered a very good session on the impact of technology, AI, ML, et cetera. Uh, we know technology has disrupted the entire globe, but it is also serving up a lot of new opportunities uh, so what are those, a few of those new opportunities you see for the L&D team and can you just share your views around that? Great, thank you for the question and uh, it's a very powerful question and it needs a deep thinking. Uh, the reason is um, I've been in the other side of uh, HR because I was not HR, being a scientist, moved into HR, it's an accidental HR I call it as. Then, uh, constantly wanted to give up, tried hard, but I did well. Uh, I did well in my role and then when I got a chance, I moved out and did a strategy and innovation for one year. Again, I'm back into uh, managing few portfolios. L&D is one of that. So having seen both sides, the constant uh, uh, struggle is to see how we can create an impact for L&D because many organizations is good to have and it is not uh, uh, something which they feel as an integral part of business. So this question was there when I was on the other side and when I came on this side then I felt how do we create that impact? All these days I was seeing and feeling. Now is an opportunity for me to do. So I call it as I see, I feel, I do. Uh, if you don't do then you don't bring the change. So with that context uh, talking about future of uh, learning and development and before even that I see that there is a great opportunity for us to create a real impact and it cannot be done without integrating learning into business 
and there are many ways to do it one of the way was innovation which i spoke in the morning unless we make it as part of the revenue unless we make it as a part of the business we will all, always be looked at we are doing something or someone one of the speakers said i don't know what lnd is doing right so those questions can be avoided if we make it an integral part of the business that's where the technology is going to be of great help because all these years it was more a classroom kind of a training and learning and uh, that's how we evolved and it was important but not many could get access to learning because it's only if you're nominated you were given that exposure today nomination has gone out of the way because of technology has disrupted that democratized learning this is talking about with the adobe uh, leaders so we were just talking about one thing which i mentioned in the morning is learning is democratized and it should be democratized because it is not like it should be within some people the knowledge should not be uh, uh, with some people it should be democratized it should be available to everybody for which learning is a great influence for knowledge now technology is going to enable us to have that learning access and it is common to everybody whether you are fresh fresher in the organization or a senior leader the learning availability or access to learning will be equal simple as just go to any of this youtube's and google you get to see what others also will get to see so no more learning is the differentiator or a knowledge is a differentiator 20 years back when we started probably uh, knowledge was uh, very scarce there was a scarcity of knowledge and it was available to some people we looked up to people for knowledge today it is not about knowledge because it is available for everyone but what do you do with what do you learn and that is where we make a difference and hence bringing the technology aspect here the technology is going to enable us to Uh, to larger extent where we will be able to leverage this democratization which is happening in the learning space so that is where your experiential learning today we are talking about experiential learning you have to be in a project you have to be in a shop floor or in the lab or in the research to experience but technology is bringing us an opportunity to experience not actually in that floor in that country or in that uh, function but you can be sitting at home still have that experience largely to 60 70% by virtual reality or augmented reality so all this will give you a feel it's much better than just looking at a video or a uh, content and learning rather you are actually experiencing but not exactly same as what you would do it physically but this breaks the boundaries so i can sit here and experience an onboarding in us which is possible by my uh, technology hence how much we are going to leverage this the future technology i don't want to list down what all there which all of you know and there are so many opportunities we have the morning again i spoke about hologram which is which is not uh, aspiration which is happening many ceos sitting in different countries are talking to people on the town hall through hologram it's not again the similar feel of touch but at least you get to see the pixels of people who are standing in front and talking versus listening to the audio or seeing the motion pictures which is more powerful than the motion picture so that's one and we are talking about virtual coaches it is not an audio coach or artificial intelligence driven chatbots but this is going beyond the, you have a robot coaching you and i have experienced that which is already happening the advantage of robot coach i'll just take a, a few uh, thoughts on that and then i'll hand over robot coaching is powerful than or artificial coaching is powerful than a human coaching i know we won't accept but you will see that happening the reason is your data is processed programmed and captured and robot remembers much better than a human being because we have to go and look at our notes to connect back if you are continuously coaching somebody for over a year but uh, artificial intelligence able to do a much better job in remembering connecting and suggesting recommending but only the factor which is missing is the emotional connection i think that is where we say Uh, the human coaching is much better than that probably we will divide into two parts part of the coaching will happen through the artificial intelligence and then the human intelligence comes to fill the gaps or to probably make decisions on coaching so those are some of the examples where our future uh, learning uh, uh, platform is going in terms of leveraging on some of the uh, tools which is not it's an unknown zone we don't know we are only talking about vrs and ars and mls but there may be much more coming and we don't know those are all in unknown zone but i'm super excited to see how we can leverage all of that but still have the human touch because that is where we make a difference so with that i turn it to you thank you chella and 
And I agree, technology is definitely going to be the driving force uh, for all of us. But I also feel we as L&D professionals should be quick in adopting the technology. Other than, uh, I mean, otherwise we'll end up losing control to it and, and play the catch-up game maybe. Thank you for that, Chala. So, Varada, my next question is to you. You gave a very good macro perspective in your session in the morning, and I would want to understand the similar macro perspective uh, for this um, session as well. So, we have so many technologies in L&D. We've already heard Chala talk so much. We've heard all the speakers speak about so many technologies. Somebody even referred to it as an elephant. What are your views in terms of the the ecosystem that we see forming in the next few years uh, with all the technologies around us? Yeah, thanks. Brilliant question. <clears throat> Let me take some cues from uh, Chella. So what I really uh, made, an, one is you spoke about the impact. It's not about the technology, it's about the impact. The second is about the experience. Uh, one that very compelling example is a ro robo coach, right? Uh, if we have to make the impact and great experience to our folks in the organization. So let's take a step back. Is our ecosystem ready to enable the L&D professionals? That's a question I just want to place in front of you. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let me pick a few uh, examples that we all know. Uh, we have this mobility marketplace, right? So where there's Olas and Ubers, what they really do is they connect between uh, uh, the passengers and the people on the other side and make it so seamless, right? Technology enabled. And the second, what they're really doing is creating an experience, creating impact, and it is also value. Two, the company that I hail from Flipkarts and Amazons of the world, where again, they kind of create that marketplace. Now, the question that I want to place in front of you, do we have a marketplace for trainers connecting the organization, right? That's an ecosystem question that I want to really place in front of you. Any, any quick reaction? Do we have a marketplace? Yeah, maybe a silence, I assume. We don't have many or maybe it is really emerging. So uh, what does that really help, right? So if you have that marketplace, if you just want to really do it, I know that one of the startup that I'm mentoring, they're into the space where they create the marketplace, they connect between... Uh, the trainers and the uh, organization. What, does, what is the problem that they are really solving using AI and ML, right? Using technology. So the, the question that we really have is, uh, do we have the complete database of trainers nationally, internationally? Few companies, large companies may they have, but if I really take in general, do they really have? Possible assumption. I have my legacy knowledge that I really carry or the organization knowledge, but there is no market knowledge that is really available, right? So by not having that market knowledge, we end up either spending more or we even take probably uh, cautiously using suboptimal trainers, right? So and therefore it, it will have an impact on the organization, your point, the impact, right? So uh, here is an organization where they have really created the marketplace using AI and ML. And let's say like I want really run a program on data plumbing, right? On data plumbing. So it, it's, it's very clear that marketplace would really connect with uh, the L&D professionals and also the business leaders. They can come together and say, here are the problem statement that I want really solve. The engine would actually recommend what could be the possible modules that you can really engage? Number one, right? And where you can really customize. Once you really try to really do, it will throw up the trainers available in the terrain, right? And not just that, their availability, their credit profiles, and also what are the possible charges that they would really do. In fact, these are all like in a split of a button, right? So what this really gives this technology is like, it tremendously reduces your management over it and it enables the, uh, the L&D professionals to really take it forward, right? The other you, uh, you, uh, kind of a case in point of this is uh, once the training is all over, we actually work with the procurement team, right? That's again a pain. I, I know a lot of you. 
So they say, you get me three quotes. I don't know, God knows why they need three quotes. <laughs> we know that here, here are the people, no, 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 I need three quotes. And they always have some excitement behind negotiation. So here this platform says, why three quotes? You have 100 quotes. Here is a platform I'll give you, you please go have fun. So it's all available to them. So, uh, so it clearly connects between uh, the user, the trainer, the L&D professionals, the business and the procurement team and seamlessly eradicates the logistic nightmare that we really go through. How beautifully there's a uh, technology that really uses. Not just that, it's again a machine learning, right? More and more, let's say like I work with Biocon, understands what that, uh, uh, the needs are. What does the data plumbing means for them? It beautifully customizes and then it will really throw up, right? So that's how like how an ecosystem can really enable uh, the l and function to make it even more impactful and create that experience. Yeah. Thank you, Varda. I really like the part uh, about the procurement. How can we get them back off our backs? And I can relate this to what Padmaja even said in the morning. I don't want to fight with compliance. Similarly, I don't want to fight with the procurement team. But yes, uh, I've seen some of these marketplaces. They are in, the, in their infancy right now and say, and we should soon be seeing them becoming mainstream and in turn a part of the entire ecosystem. So thank you for your inputs. Um, Have you figured out why three quotes? Why three quotes? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult question for me to answer. Um, all right, so my next one is for you, Padmaja. Um, we've been talking about the future of work, and we all know the future of work is hybrid. What is the future of L&D? Is it also going to be hybrid learning? Because prior to COVID, we were largely doing ILT and less on online. During COVID, we completely went uh, online. What is the future looking like? Mm. Uh, this is working? Yeah. This is working, right? Yeah, this is working. No, uh, thanks. But before I answer that, I'm going to go home and try. Alexa, uh, can you coach me on? Uh, <laughs> and see if that works. So I'm going to give that a shot and see if that works. But yeah, so Shagunta, I think while um, COVID took away a lot of the joy of learning, joy of being with people, joy of meeting people face to face, and joy of having conferences like this face to face, but it also taught us an alternate way of being together while not being physically together. So we suddenly overnight, all of us shifted to virtual classrooms, right? And started doing sessions virtually. And I think that's a learning, that's a comfort that we have developed, which will be very sad if we let go of it within a few years. It gave us the advantage of not having to travel. It gave us the advantage of pulling in people from different locations, different time zones into one session. It gave us the advantage of bringing people in for a short time to speak to somebody and go away without all the travel involved. So I, for one, truly believe that as l &D professionals, we should strive to maintain a balance between a virtual session and an in-person session. And, and also our budgets are under scrutiny. Why do 25, 30 people need to travel? Why do they need to stay for a night? Why do we have to take uh, you know, the, uh, the expenses of venue and menu? Though the people running this hotel are going to be very unhappy with what I'm <laughs> going to say, so I hope they're not there in this room. But why do we need to take those expenses? If learning can happen even to the effectiveness of 80% of what would happen in person. What I really miss is the peer learning in, in virtual sessions, where people are not interacting with each other. What I really miss is the networking that would happen otherwise, like us meeting. But for those, we need some sessions to become again in person. But for large number of sessions, we should strive to continue uh, the virtual method and maintain the benefits that we've got from there, while at the same time going back to the classroom, back to, back to in-person meeting, back to being together in a room for some parts of it. So as l and professionals, it's going to be a big responsibility for us to discern where do we go back to classroom and where do we continue being offline? Where do we replace it with hybrid, which means uh, a virtual session, or which means e-learning, or which means a lot of online work with one particular time when we all come together? So I think the future possibilities are many, many future possibilities of the combination that we can arrive at. But as l and professionals, we should strive to keep the advantages that we've got because of uh, COVID, which is comfort in sitting in front of a laptop for even six hours, eight hours, and you know, interacting with people. Mm -hmm. Those are some things I feel we should carefully work towards, and maybe the next time, the next year, the session happens, 
we'll all have stories as to have stories about how we managed to achieve a balance between that. So what I hear you say, Padmaja, is just like future is about hybrid hybrid work, the future is also about hybrid learning. I'm sure Shalmani will be like cut down on ILT and hence the carbon footprint guys. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you for that uh, input. And now I think we'll move on to the softer aspect of um, LND, and that is around culture and sustainability. So we all know the future, and Bettina, I would request you to start off uh, with your views around this topic. We all know the future of work is hybrid. We have self-forming agile teams, flatter organizations, uh, diminishing life, um, life of skills, emerging new skills, gig economies, so on and so forth. And L&D is going to play a central role in, uh, in driving culture as well as capabilities. What are some of the cultural shifts that you anticipate at work? And can you elaborate a little on what is the role that L&D will play in driving those cultural shifts? Thank you. Am I audible? Okay, good evening all. Thank you, Shagufta, for that question. Uh, you know, before I answer that, I'll start with asking the audience a question. How many of you remember the days of 40 hours of mandatory learning? <laughs> Anyone missing it? <laughs> I hope it's not still on. At least, um, you know, uh, I think that would be a big shift in culture. So, in my opinion, where we are headed towards, if you're not already there, is an outcome-based uh, culture for both from an employee or an individual standpoint or for an organization. Today, an individual is looking for quick growth, a role that makes sense. Um, compensation obviously comes with that, the works, right? And they want it fast. That what, what we hear about the great resignation and so on is nothing but that. Employers on the other end want the job done. Uh, we are dropping barriers in terms of mandatory education. Uh, we are kind of making decisions which are not traditionally based on hierarchical roles and so on. I recently had a business manager make a case for an intern who spent some time to get compensated and confirmed at the same level as somebody with 13 years of experience. Obviously, a very tall claim, right? Um, and we pushed back, of course. But we gave the manager a chance to demonstrate why, do you, why are you asking for this and how, can you prove? And she was. Okay, as an organization, I still don't think we, uh, you know, we were ready for that level of a transformation. But it just hints at outcome. So for everyone in this room, if you stop thinking of yourself as LND, but as an individual who wants to progress, does it matter how you learn or how you get there? It's just the outcome. Um, so I think organizations and employees both should be focused towards that. Now, since we are talking about this in the backdrop of technology, I think that makes it super easy for us. You today have the tools which are personalized. They can be self-paced, um, mobile friendly, what have you, right? Your learning pathway could be your own. If you think a TED Talk serves you better than being in a classroom, so be it. What do you get at the end of it? I believe that is something where the future is. Certainly the questions for the future are those. Um, I'll also come back to why learn, right? We, at least this, from, a, from my own standpoint, when I've looked at learning or made room or time for learning in the mad rush of everything that happens, one is where I feel that I'm losing you know, I, I, I might be letting go of a good opportunity. I don't know how to get to the next place. There's some help I need to get there. Whether it may be presentation skills, whether it might be a certain, you know, deep skill in particular, when that hunger is there, um, you kind of are more motivated towards working towards that. Um, or again, there's also the negative aspect of it, right? When you have lost out in your current role because you're becoming irrelevant. I think organizations need to do a better job of providing honest feedback to people. I see very casual IDPs which mean nothing most of the time. Um, and maybe there are some HR professionals in here who can take heed of that. 
but pushing that, right? Uh, being able to articulate what is it that is needed to get there? What is your organization holistically lacking in terms of skill, talent? What are the things that would help you get future ready, both in terms of soft skills and um, uh, technology? I think those are things that we should be uh, addressing. Um, those might help us get there faster. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tina. And I think I can share one example with the team here. And I feel proud about that after listening to you is uh, last year, at Briagio, we ran an initiative called Radical Liberation. And as a part of that initiative, uh, we had five uh, mandatory programs which were cut down to just one. And the senior management was bold enough to report lesser learning hours in our annual report that was published to the stakeholders. So I think that's a good move and a culture shift which we are already seeing happening. At least started in my organization and I'm sure we'll see it happening elsewhere also. Um, Shalmali, so uh, I think following up on the question around culture, we would like to hear a bit about a uh, bit from you around how can LND drive a culture that helps build sustainable organizations. Sure. So, <clears throat> firstly, uh, great to be here on this panel with such learned speakers, and it's a very tough role to. I have so many thoughts, like gems from different sessions that are swimming across in my head that it's very difficult to be in the position to kind of summarize a lot of those wonderful insights for the day. But I'll start with what you asked, uh, Shagupta, I, and, and I mentioned this in, in, my, um, in my session in the morning. I think two pivotal things are capability transformation and culture transformation that the L&D teams have to really be in the driver's seat for. Um, and I'm going to take some examples, right? Because after the session, we had some conversations. People wanted to know more about how can we, we absolutely see the need for this, but how do we drive this? So let me talk a little bit about organizations that we work with at AXA Climate who are doing this. So let me pick up the capability part first, and then I will spend uh, uh, some time on the culture piece. So I'm going to talk about an organization that we work with at, uh, called JLL. Right. You, you would have heard of the brand. And they're looking at capability development for sustainability, uh, you know, building sustainability into the fabric of the organization. And they follow a simple 1, 10, 30, 100 rule, right? And what is that? Basically, this is to say that, hey, learning really has to begin as a groundswell. It is not something that you begin. Of course, you need alignment at the top, so you're going to get your executive staff aligned on why this is important, why they have to drive it from the top. But really the onus, the momentum will begin from the groundswell. So the one hour is basically the essentials kind of alignment that they do across the organization about what is it that is required from a sustainability transition perspective for everybody in the organization, and also what the organization stands for. The second layer, which is the 10 hour, is basically creating fast tracks for how does this play out within the domain, within the role that I'm in. So if I'm in marketing, if I'm in HR, if I'm in technology, if I'm in finance, supply chain, how do I weave in um, changes in the way that I operate in my traditional role? Then the 30 hours is where we were talking about this is where the culture piece really begins, that you have to really make it systemic. You have to find ambassadors, champions within the organization. So the 30 hours is the hybrid concept here that Padmanja talked about. You'll have to kind of make it a more engagement kind of, you have to find people within the organization who are willing to be champions and ambassadors, and you invest those 30 hours of capability development with them so they can then you know, populate the ecosystem around them, uh, around them with the right culture. And the last piece is the 100 hours. This is for the really committed people who want to move into full-fledged systems up. Now the culture piece, right? And this is where I was, you know, listening to all, all of the inputs. And um, I really feel like at l and I think the fundamental thing that I've got to appreciate over the last few years is there'll always be innovations where we somehow always come to the realization the subject of L&D is a human being. So the psychology aspect of it is so important, right? When you're talking about development, it's a process of, again, I'm borrowing from what, what was spoken about at the first session, if 
those of you who are, who are here for that, is that it's really an ongoing process of continuous change management. And what is change? Change and culture, these are things that it's not something that you do. It's something you believe in. It's something you are. It has to become intrinsic, right? And that's where I feel like, how do you reinforce some of these things culturally uh, become important? Um, Varudha talked about uh, aggregator platforms, etc. And I was mentally thinking, yes, but the trouble that I have convincing Ola and Uber people to actually come and <laughs> deliver the service. So that's where the human angle really ultimately comes to, uh, to the fore. And here, I think another organization that we work quite closely with, Schneider Electric, I've seen them doing some excellent work in kind of really getting the sustainability culture going. How they do it is they basically have implemented something called commitment trackers. And they really lean into what you individually are well placed to deliver on all, along all the sustainability parameters. What is it that you can do more on, right? Are you more inclined on the environment side, the society, DEI side, uh, equity, etc.? And they really help you make a commitment to the cause, lean into and help you with the, um, you know, help you in meeting those goals. So these are some things that you can drive as an organization, really lean into the identity of people within, uh, within your uh, team. And I think that can really get the process of change going. So culture is, like, like I said, some, somebody said culture is, uh, we'll eat strategy for breakfast, right? And uh, culture for me is, it's, it's both the worst that you are willing to tolerate in your organization but also the best that you're willing to kind of rise up and really create role models in your organization that people look up to that this is how it actually works and this is who I can really be. So it really leans into people's identity. I think huge, I think, sorry if I really <laughs> dovetailed long into that question. No, not really, but I think sharing those examples were very helpful because I'm sure the entire l and uh, team here and those who are not present here are also interested in doing, everybody's keen in doing something about sustainability, but they don't know what, they don't know how to progress. And it's only nice to look up to some early adopters like JLL and Schneider, these examples that you shared. I'm sure people can go look up, find more about it and try to learn something from them. So thanks for your uh, valuable insights team. Uh, we can open the floor for questions if any. I know we are up on time, but if there are any questions, we are happy to take that. <laughs> we can take one question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Venkatesh. Uh, I'm uh, working for a health tech company called uh, Resolute. So I'm trying to understand is, um, so as of now, from my understanding, l and is more like a creating a pathway to achieve my goal, either end of this year or end of the next year or end of the third year, right? So I see, is emotion missing in l &D? Because I've seen most of the things we are talking more on the logical part and uh, logical part of the thing, right? For example, uh, Ms. Uh, Shamali uh, Nod has mentioned about, it is developing is like a process of development of the being, right? So I think the emotional part is, is the emotional part missing? I meant like, have we created any pathway for improve my being, for example, well-being, for example, um, uh, I see we had created a pathways to improve or uh, move from my one position to another position. But have we created a pathway for me to lose 20 cases of weight end of this year? Or have we, I meant like, does it come uh, under l &D or does it come under employee engagement? Did we separate this logical part or emotional part? It's a question, right? it's, it can be dumb, but I just would like to understand. Did we separate the logic and emotion? Don't worry, Venkatesh. It's not a dumb question, but uh, who from the panelists would like to answer that? Yeah, please. Interestingly, all your questions fall under my current portfolio. So L&D, talent, career progression, all sits under me. So it can be managed in different ways for different organizations. Right? It can be all sitting under one function and it can manage, or it could be separately the way we have differentiated. But we have a clear uh, line on whose accountability sits where. But to answer your question, there is an emotional uh, part to what we are talking. It's not just very logical and, and just technology. The emotional part is what, what I was talking in the morning. It's not about only skill. Skill can take you miles. 
but there is something called skill intelligence and that intelligence where the human touch comes because the willingness to convert your skill to an actionable item which can take you and grow you right so that part is the attitude part and that's where the emotion comes in along with attitude right so that is how i i, I understood your question where is there an emotional context to this yes from the accountability perspective is that learning leads to growth yes then uh, my uh, my introspection on that is learning by itself will not take you anywhere okay it is a knowledge how what do you do with what do you know and then do you have a platform an opportunity within the organization to convert your skill and that's where i use the word skill intelligence which is not very commonly used but i'm saying if there is an artificial intelligence there has to be skill intelligence and that could take you to growth path if anyone wants to add all right so um, vinkesh right yeah so um, i think the question that you just said two parts which really struck me well one is are we doing anything on wellness does it really fall under lnd or employee engagement if that is right okay let me attempt uh, the best of my knowledge so i think the last two years after covid i think all of us are uh, we are talking about wellness and all of it right but let's step back are we really addressing it holistically uh, my my experience with whatever that i have experienced whatever i seen wellness i think we are taking a very much a banded approach right okay i am getting a yoga trainer it's wellness i am getting a dietitian it's a wellness i am doing a stepathlon it's a wellness right is that wellness i just want to pose a question to this group okay therefore what is wellness my own view see a uh, wellness to me is like at any given point in time as human being uh, we go through this continuum of illness to wellness the assumptions in the organization we do is everybody are healthy right so and also like somebody gave an example only when you hit a heart attack you really walk right so that's the kind of a culture that we have so are we really creating using technology creating a personalized cohort based wellness journey at least i have not experienced it holistically so far so now a second part of a question does it really fall under lnd or employee engagement i think we can passionately discuss and argue uh, but it's i would say like uh, uh, i think it is more of employee engagement but can be driven through lnd did i answer I think the good part about this guys is 10 years back we were not even talking about uh, mental health and uh, emotional well-being right we've started talking about it so it's good that as an organization we are trying to become more human from looking at people as labor laborers whatever labors we've moved to looking at them as people who have emotion flexibility with work timing you know etc these are all signs that as an organization we are moving towards the emotion side of uh, you know the people maybe it's just a start maybe like what varada mentioned that we may are we really doing it it's a bandaid fine it's a bandaid but i'm sure it's going to evolve with time with the kind of focus that organizations are giving today and three key areas i hear from most organizations globally is diversity mental health and well-being and sustainability these are hot topics which every organization is going after so it's a start i'm sure we'll reach there soon all right great thank you thank you so much to all the eminent panel speakers please give them a huge round of applause